Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another Friday morning at the Fun House with Martin Popoff. Today is part two of our uh, look at mega album follow-up letdown. So those albums that followed a big, huge album that spawned a lot of singles, sold a ton of copies, the band plays most of the songs live, and then they come out with the next album and all of a sudden, bloop, what happened, right? Nobody yeah. buys it. Nobody cares about it. The band doesn't seem to care about it. The sales are not there, the whole nine yards. So uh, Martin and I have each carved out five more for you today. And uh, good morning, Martin. Yes. Ready when you are. And uh, here we are another Friday, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So my, uh, in the fifth position. So what I did is uh, I ranked these by, um, by uh, least or, or most mild of a letdown in, in the various ways that we talked about these, like last episode and this episode to, to most horrendous letdowns. So, so I'm going to start with um, Peter Gabriel with the, the us album. Okay which follows the So album. There's my, there's my vinyl of that, right? So the problem with this record was that, um, so first of all, he goes gold with the first one, bit of excitement, he's coming out of Genesis, and then nothing, and then nothing, uh, which is quite odd. I thought, I thought face, melting face would have been gold or something, but maybe, maybe we've got a certification problem or whatever. Security goes gold, but So goes five times platinum. So he's, he's the big it guy at this point. He's early in on the videos. He's doing all that cool stuff. So he's got all the gizmos going on in the, in the videos, you know, sledgehammer and all that. Um, but, you know, I look at the track listing of this and, and like almost every song was played on the radio, Red Rain, Sledgehammer, Don't Give Up, um, In Your Eyes, Mercy Street, Big Time, right? Um, hits, hits, hits after hits off of this thing. So that's 1986. You know, he's got the video with Kate Bush and all that, but, the problem is he waits six years to put this thing out. And, uh, and so his, his ship has flown in and he's such a creative guy. He probably doesn't even care, right? He's off doing all sorts of cool things. You know, money probably doesn't mean a lot to him. I mean, he's just the, the whole career part. I'm sure his record label was up in arms more than anybody at, at say, taking so long in the follow-up, but, um, so, so this is a, this is a commercial letdown, but it does go platinum because there's still some goodwill left for him out there, and the, and the mammoth tours, and and he's so amazing live and the whole bit, right? But um, so this this album had come talk to me on it, which was pretty cool. But you know, Steam is just another hammer and big time sort of all over again. It's got digging in the dirt, which was a little bit of a single. Kiss that frog has kind of a hip hop beat, so there's some kind of hip hoppy beats on it. Ten songs, the songs are all really long. Um, you know, it's like 56 minutes or whatever. The band is still more or less intact. I mean, all these records have all sorts of players on them, but the band is more or less uh, intact, except there's no Jerry Murata. So there's there's um, there's uh, Larry Fast and David Rhodes and Tony Levin and all that um, from previous. But even even on So, he, he had like just an army of extra people on there. Um, but this record to me, I've always, um, it's a little dour. It's a little slow. Um, you know, it's like I say, I mean, the, uh, the previous one is banger after banger but um still pretty cool um and like i say it went platinum but uh but yeah it, it it's almost like they're the cult sonic temple after those first two it's almost like a melange of security and so mixed together with way too many layers of things put on it it's like overworked and it feels like it took six years to to make so there you go number five peter gabriel s yeah, and I think uh, we've probably spoken about a lot, and we may sp speak a little bit more today about these bands who take forever to release a new album after a big blockbuster and what happens. You know, people do forget. And it's not, uh, you know, there's this mentality of what have you done for me lately, right? Not only with the record labels, but with yep. the buying public. And six years is a long time. And I know these days we talk about how quick the years go by, but. I mean, back in the 80s and the 90s, it's like six years is an eternity. It's almost like you were never here. It's almost like you never had that massive album, right? Here today, gone tomorrow. You just There's a lot of artists that I think, and, you, and you're absolutely right about Gabriel probably not caring, right? Because if he really care, you know, I mean, he left Genesis when Genesis were really starting to rise. Yeah, he went off and did his own thing. Didn't necessarily set the world on fire with those really good early solo albums. But uh, if he really cared about the fame and fortune and all that kind of stuff, he may have stuck around. But I think he always wanted to kind of uh, do his own thing at his own pace and his whole solo career. Perfect example of that. Yeah. Exactly. 
All right, so my next, uh, or my first choice, I should say, is uh, an American band who uh, had, uh, you know, a lot of tragedy early on in their career. They were one of those bands that um, didn't really set the world on fire with their first couple of albums, although as a touring band, they were certainly opening a lot of eyes. Their third album was this massive live album that became their big seller at the Fillmore East, right? And uh, then, of course, they lost two of their band members, you know, talking about the Allman Brothers band, uh, you know, Dwayne Allman, Barry Oakley, gone fairly soon after each other. The band kind of regrouped and released Brothers and Sisters, which was ironically, you know, af you know, after the tragedy. And here, all of a sudden, the band hits the big time. Uh, Dickie Betts becoming somewhat of the de facto leader of the band alongside uh, Greg Allman. Big hit, uh, Ramblin' Man, kind of a crossover track, right? Kind of like a country rock type of thing. Wasted Words became a very popular song within the band. Southbound, certainly. And of course, Jessica, one of the most beloved instrumentals of all time. So this one went over platinum, right? It's big business critically, the hit single and, and everything. Well, and you know, you fast forward not that long afterwards. And of course you got, you know, band members coming and going. Um, they released this album, Win, Lose, or Draw. All right. So here you've got, uh, again, a, a different lineup. You've got Dickie, you've got Greg, you've got J-Mo and Derek Trucks. And then uh, you've also got Chuck Leavell on piano. All right. So now instead of getting another guitar player, they're trying, they're adding keyboards and piano to kind of replace the dual guitar attack. Uh, and you got Lamar Williams on bass. And at this time, you know, the band members are also doing solo projects, uh, Greg is dating Cher, there's that whole distraction, and they're doing a lot of drugs. And basically this album sounds like a band that's completely distracted with all of these things we're talking about. Uh, if you read any of the Allman Brothers books, uh, they were not getting along whatsoever. And you know, as we've seen so many times, these bands that got heavily involved in the drug scene and all these distractions tend to implode from within. I mean, we, we've talked about it with Aerosmith and Black Sabbath and all these other groups. The Allmans, no, no, no different here. And this album barely goes gold. No, re no hit singles at all. And no songs here that were even played, you know, throughout the career that, that you ever see pop up in set lists at all. A couple of good ones, certainly. High Falls, which is the big rambling instrumental from Dickie Betts. Fantastic song, kind of like uh, In Memory of Elizabeth Reed, part two. But, you know, the rest of it, you know, can't lose what you never had. They tried to push that as a single, didn't catch on. Just another love song, kind of bland and ballady. Uh, the title track is okay. For the most part, a pretty forgettable album. And considering the greatness that came right before and even those early albums, I mean, this was a massive disappointment from you know, sales wise. Uh, you know, the critics didn't like it. The fans kind of stayed away. And it's you know, a real shame. But again, uh, another example of the rock and roll excesses, you know, which again, followed some tragedy in this case that uh, basically kind of blew a band, uh, the band apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crappy album cover too, right? And, oh, absolutely. And Brothers awful. and Sisters was such a great album. I, I love Wasted Words. It's probably my favorite favorite song they ever absolutely. did, actually. You know, and so. and this album cover, and you know, you're talking about album covers. I mean, this album cover basically describes the feel of the album. I mean, you look at it, it's just like, I mean, how endearing is this? You know, you've got yeah. these two kids out in the backyard in yeah. nature and all this kind of stuff. It's like this kind of nice slice of Americana. And then you got this and it's like, well, what, what is this? Right. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. So my number four choice, I'm going with uh, Rolling Stones Emotional Rescue, which is the follow up. There we go. Uh, and it's the follow up to this monster here. Here's my big box set of, of um, some girls. So, and I think I might even showed that last uh, last time we did this because there I talked about tattoo use. So this kind of happened twice, right? Um, but this one is uh, it's really pronounced in terms of the, um, the um, public opinion shifting on the band big time, I, I think from some girls to emotional rescue. I mean, everybody was celebrating the stones, this, this, uh, you know, New York, New York band at this point. Right. I mean, there, there's all this fulcrum of them hanging out in New York and, and, and introducing New York sounds into, into the records and some girls, you know, most of that record was played on the radio. It was just a magic, magic time for the stones. Uh, it went six times platinum. Then they follow it up very quickly, quick, you know, quick by their standards, 
um, with uh, with emotional rescue, with that you know thermal heat imaging album cover that doesn't really speak to anybody, right? Yeah, it's just just kind of weird and obscure. Um, but then the music on it uh, is very. Um, it's, it's very stripped down and uh, it, the critics kind of savaged it and thought, you know, this is like rehashed versions of older songs. You've got, you know, Let Me Go is is really cool. My favorite song on it is sung by Keith. Uh, that's all about you. Um, but dance is sort of like a, like almost like a disco jam, you know, uh, for them. It, it literally, the band literally on this record just kind of slinks onto the stage and starts playing on this record right and then and then it's it's that casual all the way through there's there's a little bit of you know there, there's a little bit of extra instrumentation and stuff on it but um mostly this is just the band playing um you know these these kind of pretty rote uh earthy rock and roll tunes you've got send it to me as a reggae it's just barely written it's just barely barely there so so like a so like i say is dance uh, i think emotional rescue was a hit almost despite itself it's it's like a novelty song with the falsetto and stuff she's so cold was a little bit of a single but it's doing nothing new that we haven't heard from the stones before um you know this same old charlie beat and all that it's got a boring boring blues on it down in the hole um but yeah, so so um, summer romance is, is one of these these rote boogie rock things. Or there's let me go is kind of the same thing. Uh, Where the boys go is sort of the same thing. And then um, she's so cold. So so there's a bunch of songs that are that are no big include you know improvement over like when the whip comes down or respectable or any of those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, I the, the thing that I I really remember at that time is like everybody turned on the stones with this record. They, they, they like thought you guys are just phoning it in. The last one was so good. Uh, and, and yet, you know, it's still, some girls is still the stones, but it's, but it's charming. It's still casual, but it's just, everybody was rooting for the stones on that one and loving what they were doing and track after track and all the differences. And this one just feels like a weak demo version of that one. The last thing I want to say about it, one of the cool things about it is that some of the songs from that session even got carried over into Tattoo You. There was Little TNA, No Use in Crying and Hang Fire great songs all yeah, of them absolutely <laughs> all carried forward to the next album which the stones are totally back everybody's loving them again yeah. so in 78 they're they're a massive band they're everybody's favorite band and you know up into tattoo you it's back again but for this one record everybody turned on them so there you go yeah i mean you mentioned phoning it in and that's exactly what this album sounds like it's like i mean and i like you know parts of this album uh i, I actually like the title track but to me this sounds like the band was riding high from some girls probably wanted to enjoy their success for a few years. And the label's probably like, well, you guys got to crank out another album. We got to strike while the iron is hot here. And they're like, ah, all right, let's just give them something. And you know, what they do go in over the weekend and just put this together because part of it kind of sounds like that. And then you look at the follow-up album, which is so great. And you're like, what happened here? Right. But uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. Not their worst album by any means, but uh, it, it definitely, it's lackluster in a big way compared to what can be, can, came before and certainly what came after. Yeah, that's a good pick. All right, my next pick is uh, probably gonna upset Martin a little bit because I know Martin is a big fan of this album and actually I am too. Um, but you know, we're, we're not really talking about whether we like these or not. That's not the point here. The point of this is, uh, you know, compared to the albums that came before it, uh, it was a bit of a letdown, right? So here we're talking about uh, letdowns and get the let out and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> so the album is Presence from Led Zeppelin, a fine album. All right. And I don't think anybody's going to deny that. But, you know, unfortunately, it, it had the task of following up this monster, Physical Graffiti, um, not long before it, which, you know, did huge business. I mean, it's a double album. So, you know, you look at the uh, RIAA thing, it's like 16 million, right? But of course, eight, it, it's eight it's double because of the double album yeah. so sold eight million copies that, that's a lot back then right uh in the mid 70s and spawned all sorts of legendary tracks and i think you know most people myself included one of the greatest double albums of all time uh and then they come back with this one you know a couple of years later which i still dig i like i mean it's not my favorite zeppelin album it's certainly not their worst uh i think it's got some really good tracks on it but 
you almost got the the feeling based on i mean no no hits on this album right no real songs that you're going to hear on classic rock radio then or now uh, of course achilles last stand everybody loves nobody's fault but mine everybody loves you know a couple of really good tracks but it barely made it to, to three million copies sold so it's a big drop off from not only physical graffiti but all the other ones that came after it and you almost got the impression that's like well either there's a little zeppelin fatigue going on or, you know, maybe the band's heart really wasn't in this particular one. You know, you got the weird album cover, which I still think is really cool. But again, uh, sometimes, you know, we all talk about you go into record stores back in the 70s and the 80s and you're buying stuff based on those eye popping album covers. And could this get overlooked sitting there in the racks? Right. Without the Led Zeppelin across the front, line, you know, possibly. But uh, I, I just think for me, the artisticness of the albums that came before it maybe a little lacking here, but there's some spectacular songs on this album that for whatever reason, the general public just didn't latch onto and embrace like prior Led Zeppelin albums for whatever reason. But I still play this. I still enjoy this, uh, but you can't help but look at it as a, uh, a letdown, especially after uh, Physical Graffiti. And I know you've got some stuff to say about this one. because Yeah, I mean, I, I like the album a lot. I, I love the album, actually. I love every Led Zeppelin album, but um, I, I have considered it some somewhat uh, uh, you know definitely a, a big letdown i mean after after physical graffiti which is so amazing and one of my favorite albums of all time i i like that this record is fairly heavy but we actually now i don't know i mean i i have a a, a couple of worsts but when we did an episode of the contrarians on worst led zeppelin album we actually picked presents so and we got a lot of stick for that but uh but i, I could go presents i could go one i could go two believe it or not uh and then everybody brings up in through the outdoor but i i think this is the one this is the one where i also did an episode of my podcast history in five songs where i i looked at this one as definitely the worst in terms of when it came out in time and the competition against it there's a lot of competition that was blowing it out of out of the water rainbow rising aerosmith rocks black sabbath sabotage um you know into technical ecstasy even i think <laughs> i would even put that higher than this one um but uh, but I, I totally agree. It, it feels like the, their emotional rescue, their phoned in, their, their phoned in record uh, in, in a way. And, and you're right. I never really thought about how nothing off of this is played on classic rock radio. They, they've just like shunted it aside. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and I think that's the only album of theirs where you can say that. Yeah. Good choice. Yeah. Excellent. OK, cool. All right. Um, so my next choice, my number three is. Uh, this record right here, Twisted Sister, come out and play. Um, you know, this is one that always, you know, has to make these lists, I think, in, in a certain way, because, uh, you know, it, they're so loud and garish and, and it's so obvious, like what the big problem was. I mean, essentially, they're coming off of a record that went. So the first one's not certified. I think it's my favorite record. The second one uh, went gold. I love it a lot. Um, Stay Hungry, I Love, it went three times platinum, so it was a pretty big album for them. Um, but then the follow-up, um, you know, I think the band's starting to get tired and splintering and all that sort of thing. So here's, here's Stay Hungry, which is, you know, your absolute, uh, you know, pretty much pretty much a classic in, in certain ways. I mean, it's not my favorite Twisted Sister, but it had the two big hits. And then the, the big travesty of this, well, first of all, it's produced by Dieter Dierks, which is very odd. Um, yeah. You know, Scorpions producer, except Scorpions, all that kind of thing. It's weird that it's produced by him. Um, but uh, the production is is not great, but not terrible. I mean, he, he does adopt a lot of sort of hair metal tropes when he does the production and the drums are really big. But the big problem with this you know, even, even starting with the whole, the whole rip from the Warriors, you know, Warriors come out and play, Twisted Sister come out and play and hitting the bottles and that. So even that seemed a little, eh, okay, that's a little goofy. They're, they're kind of going, you know, they're, they're, it's almost like they're trying to get their audience even younger than it even was on, uh, on we're not going to take it if that's even possible, right? Because it's a pretty adolescent band already at that point, right? But they do leader of the pack. They do this, this big, you know, splashy, cover of a Shangri-La song and that that ticked off all metalheads including me of course and then Be Cruel to Your School is just as horrible with the Brian Setzer's on it and Billy Joel and Alice Cooper and somebody else um somebody else doing something anyway uh, Clarence Clemens I think um so there's there's like horn there's sax on it or whatever so so the two lead singles were were just like complete novelty you know 
flagrant commercialism and and it didn't get a lot better uh in uh, fr- through the album after that you got the two wrote ballads ballads on it king of fools and i believe in you i believe in you is just a horrible hair metal ballad um you know the band is still somewhat together at this point but then the next record you know and the tour is bad for it and they're starting to splinter the next record was even going to be a d snyder solo album. we did a contrarians episode on worst twisted sister album and it was love is for suckers but this got a lot of votes um, this is, the, it, you know, it's almost a split vote thing. It's like they fell right off. Everybody loves the first three and pretty much dislikes the, uh, the last two. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, big problems with this and, and they were just screaming problems at you. They, they were just like, they were just like daring the metal heads to hate them with be cruel to your school and leader of the pack. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's a great choice. Uh, Rich Catino uh, on another show we were doing, it was also talking about that particular release and uh, yeah, it's not very good. Not very good. And the sales showed it, right? All right. So, uh, you know, before I continue on, I do want to stop and uh, make note of uh, Martin and I are both wearing some pretty cool Sea of Tranquility shirts here. So uh, if you want, you know, the, that's one of one of the many regular Sea of Tranquility styles. If you're a fan of our Monsters Den show that we also do on here, there's the Monsters Den shirt, which you can uh, check out any of these and all our other designs in the link below in the um, video description. Right. So check those out. All right. So I'm going to take a little book out of Martin's page here and do a, a somewhat of a contrarian thing here. So a lot of people have been calling for us to talk about Boston in this format right and everybody seems to want to point towards don't look back as the big mega letdown after the debut but the fact of the matter is don't look back was still a blockbuster album yeah i mean big time yeah and i mean it's still sold like what eight million copies or something like that that's i mean yeah it's a letdown from the debut as far as like sales go but how can you consider that a letdown for the most part, right? So I decided, well, you know what? I'm gonna go a little further in the catalog and I'm not even gonna pick third stage because third stage also did like 4 million copies, right? Still a really big album and still a couple of the original guys intact. So where I'm gonna go here is I'm gonna go with a walk on as the letdown from this. Okay, so here, you know, we've got, this is basically now, and it, it kind of had been on the previous album, but this is basically the Tom Schultz show. Um, and he's, you know, at this point in time, he's not even really interested in bringing back any of the, you know, other members, including Brad, right, who is the voice of Boston. So you basically got another guy who kind of sounds like him. But we talked earlier about the Peter Gabriel thing, taking all those years in between. Well, Boston at this point in time was notorious for, taking a bit of time putting out albums right mm-hmm. to and to the point where you know the first the second album came what two three albums after the first and then all of a sudden you had like six years and now all of a sudden you've got eight years uh which is a long time and by this time you know is boston kind of forgotten mm, i don't know i mean still they got uh, this one what uh this went platinum okay this one just squeezed out platinum a million copies but here you got you know fran cosmo on uh vocals and you know an assortment of other guys who you know most people had no idea who they were it kind of sounds like boston kind of not but again no no radio hits for the first time ever uh some good songs decent you know the title track is pretty good there's the kind of really cool instrumental uh they tried to push magdalene didn't really catch the public's attention much you know a couple kind of ballady things i need your love it's it's kind of lacking in balls it still has that boston the guitar sound is there of course but at this point in time it's kind of sounding a little robotic and i think that's what a lot of people uh, had an issue with a lot of the Boston albums after those first two albums. It was like, there's a kind of a creepiness to the music that it's like, you know, these albums took so long to do. You don't know really who's playing what, you know, it's a, you look at the liner notes, it kind of tells you, but is, and, and there's just this kind of haunting uh, quality to all of these latter period albums that like it just sounds like something that was pulled out of a garbage can found in like a, a landmine a, a landfill somewhere it's like oh here's this old you know recording from this band called Boston and it's just like I don't know it's like a, a pale representation of those the greatness of those first couple albums but like I said people still bought it just not as much I still like it but to me the first three albums are the real Boston albums and anything after that is just a letdown. And 
it's just, I think I continue to listen and buy because of nostalgia reasons. Cause I, I love Tom Schultz a lot. I think, you know, he's a great player, great producer and a you know, very intelligent guy. But um, yeah, I think uh, for me, the biggest letdown in this catalog started right here. Cause I, th I still think, you know, you're selling, you know, you got a single on here, you got Amanda did pretty well. Um, you got a, a bunch of other tunes on here that they play live still when they do play. And this still sold a lot of copies. So uh, this is the, this is the look down here in this catalog. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess people are realizing the bad vibes and the fact that it doesn't feel like a band and you hear in, you know, through the grapevine about fighting over money and all that kind of stuff. Right. And, you know, good album cover on it. I, I swear, you know, of the, of those million copies, it's probably 200,000 of them were like, Hey, they, someone saw that in the racks, great cover, you know, a lot of energy. There's that logo, right? Oh, Boston's <laughs> back. I got to buy this thing. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's, if, if they don't put out that many albums, there's enough people who remember the old stuff to, uh, yeah. But yeah, that's a whole nother story like Tom and production and that because later on he's using even drum machines and stuff. But then you talk to him about it and it's like, no, I programmed every single sound and you can't hear it. But every single sound is slightly different than the one before. It's like, OK, you're way too deep into the weeds here. Just get a real drummer. You yeah, know, exactly. it's going to take one hundredth the time and it's going to sound way better. So it's like he's he's working hundreds of hours on these things to put out something that people don't think sounds very good. Yeah. They're just not yeah. connecting with. Yeah. Corporate America or whatever. Corporate right? America, so, especially. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. It's very odd. Eh? And then, yeah, it's uh, you need Brad Delp, right? You know, you yeah, need, you do. And unfortunately uh, he's not with us anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And for all you Boston fans, I'm going to make the announcement right now. Cause I've been keeping it quiet on this very show next week, Mr. Barry Goodrow, former lead guitarist with Boston. So stay tuned for that next week. Yeah. All right. Okay, my second choice, I won't talk about this too long because I know what Pete Pete thinks about The Clash, but <laughs> but this is a classic one. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty quick story. Um, essentially, uh, they, they finally had, uh, well, they, they were super famous. People loved to death London Calling and it, it went platinum. And then Sandinista was a triple album and it went gold, but that's probably you know based on a third because it's a triple, right? And even the first one went gold. So this was a pretty, pretty um, successful band. Beloved all, as all get out, like London Calling was is rated one of the greatest albums of all time. I think Time Magazine even had it, had it that in their poll. But so they had this come out, it goes platinum pretty quickly. Uh, and it's now double platinum and it has their biggest hits on it. Should I stay or should I go? And uh, what was the other one that was pretty big? Rock the Casbah, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But some good songs and it's very, um, they're, they're really changing what they're doing rapidly. I'm not a fan of this album very much. Um, it's just too weird. It's got a lot of, a lot of sounds and it's atmospheric and really downwound. And it's, they, they changed a lot from Sandinista. So I'm not a huge fan of this album anyways. Um, but what happened was three years later, they put out Cut the Crap, which is, you know, just begging you to hate it, right? Um, but, uh, but Mick Jones is gone. So the two most important guys, Joe Strummer and Mick Jones, one of them is gone. And, uh, and, and actually, um, th there's, there's like three replacements. That's right. Drummer gone too. So it's three replacements, um, just new guys. They, they look pretty cool. They look like rockers. It's a great, yeah. great picture. Um, but... Um, so the other problem is, so, so it's not the clash already. And then the other big problem is uh, their, their manager, Bernie Rhodes, very controversial figure. He kind of takes over and produces this thing and just puts, just fills it up with sound effects and, and program drums and the whole thing. This, this record actually, uh, I, I like almost as much as the previous one. That's how much I don't like combat rock, but um this is this is one of those funny things where um, I I could see somebody you know one of these studio wizard guys like a, like a Robert Barry or a Stephen Wilson like take take the guitars and Joe's awesome voice off and totally redo the music in and in, in a in a just a normal guitar bass and drums form and this would be a pretty good album actually but um, but yeah it's it's all electronic programming and and ton, tons and tons of layering of weird sounds this is a this is a legendary let down album in the world of let down albums and there's a there's a whole documentary on it by the i think it's by the same guy who did that one when we talked about the steely dan gaucho documentary like a really super detailed story of what 
went wrong with the abomination that has cut the crap. It's 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 known out there in the world as one of the worst albums of all time. It's it it makes a lot of those lists. So there there's a good one to put on here. So double platinum down to like there, there's just no way it was even close to certification. Hmm. There you go. So a couple things about the Clash because I know it's probably going to come up in the comments section below. So uh, yeah, I don't, oh, I know. <laughs> I don't hate the Clash. Um, I actually own a Clash like collect, hits collection, which I, I always liked all their hits. Yeah. I never felt the need to kind of uh, you know go beyond that for whatever reason because of probably my misgivings about punk. Even though I don't find a lot of the Clash's music really punk in, in the you know broad sense of the term. But last night, so I had the show with Mike Portnoy last night. Of course, London Calling was one of his top ten double albums right so he was asking me my opinion on the album and I was like well you know I don't own it I've never I've never you know I've never honestly really even listened to the whole thing and he was surprised right but then we got to one of my picks which was Exile on Main Street by the Stones and he had the same attitude about that so we made each other a pact at the end of the episode that we were both going to go and listen to each album and report back to each other after giving it so this morning before this show I actually listened to all of London Calling and you know what it's pretty good and I might actually just go out and get it so so, you know, there you have it. Right. As for the other albums, we'll see. I one step baby steps, right, Martin? Baby yeah, steps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So my next choice, uh, again, an album that uh, I do like quite a bit, but compared to the greatness that came before it, it it's certainly a letdown. So uh, the man Kansas, American prog rock man, released two albums in a row that were, you know, huge hits, Left Overture and even more so Point of No Return. Uh, were massive hits for the band. Totally broke the band, especially here in this country, but also other parts of the world. Uh, Dust in the Wind became a huge hit. The title track, Point of No Return, played a lot on classic rock radio. A lot of the tracks from this album played by the band live all throughout the years. And, you know, production-wise, just uh, Jeff Blixman, it just sounds spectacular um, in every way. And it's just an epic album. And, you know, it's one of those perfect albums. Uh, we talked about it on the Perfect Album series uh, for me. And, uh, again, uh, how many, what do we do? Four times platinum, right? Four million copies plus the, you know, Dust in the Wind made a gazillion dollars, right? So they come back uh, not that long afterwards. They decided to produce their the next album by themselves. They decide to kind of tackle more Native American uh, themes and whatnot, and they come out with Monolith, uh, which, you know, barely made it to gold. No hit singles. They tried to promote People of the South Wind, which is actually a pretty tuneful song and pretty catchy song, but uh, didn't catch the, the public's eye like Dust in the Wind or certainly carry on Wayward Sun for whatever reason. Uh, the album is a little darker, not as kind of bright and shiny as the two that came before it. Certainly still progressive. It's certainly heavy in spots. I mean, there's some really good stuff on here. On the other side is really good. Angels are falling. How my soul cries out for you is pretty damn heavy. Uh, Glimpse of home is gorgeous. Stay out of trouble is another really heavy song. Um, I don't know why this didn't really grab the public's attention. Again, we're looking at the late 70s, so those big hit singles are becoming really, really important to rock bands. And maybe because this had nothing on it that just caught the attention of radio stations. Um, the album definitely doesn't sound as good as the two prior that came before it. There's a, there's a from a production standpoint, those, those two that came right before it are like, I mean, as good as it gets. Uh, this is a little more kind of earthy sounding album, which, you know, maybe that had something to do with it too. You know, maybe the album cover, you know, you look at uh, this and certainly Left Overture, and then you look at this. It's like, I mean, I like it, but will, you know, Joe Smith, who's walking in a record shop, see that and be like, oh, I got to have that, you know, back in the day where we were buying albums based on those amazing album covers. I don't know. You know, it's kind of kind of weird looking, you know, this kind of like... Um, Indian spaceship, you know, spacey type thing. I don't know. And then you got the back. So you know what this album is kind of all about. But yeah, um, not, and even when you talk to Kansas fans all these years later, this rarely comes up like in a top five album discussion. So even all these years later, the legacy of Monolith is, you know, it's not, it's like a middle of the road Kansas album. I dig it, but it's definitely for almost anybody you talk to, a letdown after the greatness of this one. Yeah. 
And all those sales, I mean, I'm even surprised it went gold. I mean, all those sales are just based on carryover from the previous two albums. It's just the yeah. goodwill from the previous stuff, right? Yeah. It's just, it's just not, it's just not a hit album. It's not the kind of thing that that uh, tons and tons of people need in their lives. That record, right? A, yeah. a self-produced, you know, pretty ragged sounding album. Yeah, it uh, is compared yeah. to the other ones, which are just, just so so you know dead on and perfectly produced, right? Yep. Well, yep. yep. All right, so my last one. So as I said, I was going in in reverse order of uh, travesty, right? Uh, to to the most intense at the last. Um, so it, can there actually be a worse trav travesty than cut the crap? I I think so. Um, so I went with um, this album right here, David Bowie, tonight. Um, you know what what kind of a title is tonight? It's ridiculous, right? Or. Uh, can, can you actually have a worse title than tonight? Yes, you can. Never let me down. You can. And, and you can even have a worse album. So this is, this is a big letdown. So what happened was, um, you know, David had, um, just like we were talking about with the Stones, he had a ton of goodwill built up with this album, even though, even though it's, uh, it's really commercial and polished, it's, it's like their ZZ Top Eliminator. Um, you know, he was daring people to hate David Bowie, but People did not hate David Bowie. They loved that new stage thing and him in the suits. And up there, I saw this tour as the first concert uh, ever in BC Place Stadium when they built it. I've, I've probably talked about this before, but it was Bowie in the middle slot, Peter Gabriel on security and the tubes on uh, inside outside, like just everybody at the peak of their powers, right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but so everybody loved this. And, uh, you know, uh, obviously... You know, where do we, so we've got Modern Love, of course, was big. Let's Dance was big. Um, so a lot of goodwill, a lot of goodwill for him. People were championing, championing the, the change in pace. Scary Monsters is my favorite Bowie by far. Um, but this was all, was one of those reinventions and everybody loves talking about his reinventions. So he does, uh, uh, not that one, he does this one. So that, this is Afterburner, right? And this is a uh, this is a uh, recycler, right? Yep. <laughs> um, so, um, as you know, uh, just a, a horrendous sort of a turn of events here. You know, he he does the he does the one redo of an Iggy Pop song on um, on on uh, on Let's Dance, but here he does he does Don't Look Down in in like a like a horrifically 80s production version of let's do it as a reggae song so they do this reggae version of don't look down from iggy's new values they do uh from lust for life iggy album they do tonight and hey let's get tina turner to sing on it great um they do a uh, neighborhood threat from lust for life and again this is all with like every 80s production thing thrown at it and even worse on on never let me down right Blue Jean, I love to death Blue Jean. I think it's a great single. I love the video. So it's, it's you know, by far the, the greatest thing. It's probably almost my favorite thing he did in all of the all of the 80s. I love Blue Jean. Um, but Tumble and Twirl was, was an Iggy song, although not on an Iggy album. But it's full of, like, chicken scratch guitar and horns and all this stuff. I keep forgetting is, like, it's a cover. Um, God Only Knows is a cover. Um, and so there's only like, uh, yeah, nine songs on this, uh, dancing with the big boys again, brain disco horns and Iggy co-writes on it and sings on. It. I mean, Iggy's got as much going on on this album as David Bowie, but the whole thing is, uh, is just so over the top eighties production. So it was like him doing the afterburner to the eliminator. Let's just throw even more at it. And then they even did it again and, and it got even worse. And you could say recycler is maybe worse than worse than the first two uh, as well. So you could, you could almost write a little uh, essay or something on those three records uh, put together. Cause there's a lot of similarities, right. Yeah. Um, or six records put together. So, so yeah, D David Bowie uh, t tonight, uh, Mr. Mr. Sellout, right? Everybody thinks he's a great artist, right? He's just the greatest artist and no one is more creative than David Bowie. Well, he can sell out too. So that's what yeah. tonight was. <laughs> you know, it's funny because uh, Let's Dance came up a couple of weeks ago on another show. I forget exactly which one it was. And um so many people wrote in about how they hate the Let's Dance album and, you know, compared to Scary Monsters and all that's, you know, the couple that came before it, that that should have been the letdown, right? Or that way. And it's like, but like Let's Dance is like the first time you heard that album. It was so immediate, right? I mean, yeah. every song on that album is just, just hit you in the face and you're singing it like five minutes later. Yeah. 
And that album you just talked about, other than Blue Jean, it's like faceless, right? I mean, it's just like, there's nothing that you want to go back to on there, unfortunately. By the way, Peter, I have to mention, I I forgot about this. So this is a crazy thing here. So David Bowie, I think we've talked about this before, but the certification seemed to be a mess on him. I don't think he ever got certified after sort of the 80s. So, so Let's Dance, believe it or not, is, um, is, uh, is certified officially. And I went on RIAA and checked this again this morning and it's, it's sitting there and that's, so Wiki matches RIAA. It's platinum and tonight even went platinum, but also on Wiki, it says, Let's dance worldwide, 11 million copies. So I, th- I think, I think let's, I, I think his certifications are so out of date. And that's the other thing on RIA. I noticed that, you know, these records, the last time they were ever looked at was like 1984, or 1985, yeah. and they were instantly that big. So I, I think, I think let's dance is a, is a triple four times platinum album. Oh, absolutely. I was just going to say, there's no way that that only sold a million copies. There's yeah. no way. I mean, that that album was enormous, and the, all those hits on there. Th- there's no way. Yeah, and especially at that at that in that year, right when the record sales were at an all time high. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I I dig the Let's Dance album quite a bit. I mean, it's 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 it was an enormous success for a reason. So just like Martin did, kind of save the best for last or the worst for last. Uh, the biggest offender here on my list today. Um, uh, to this day, and I love this band, love them. I can't listen to this album. Just can't listen to this album. So uh, like the year before, was there two years in between? I forget, I didn't write down the dates. But the Queen puts out this album called The Game, which was their, you know, they had some big selling albums before, but this was their blockbuster. It's been, you know, here in North America, certainly. Uh, it's almost like that with this album, they were trying to be a little bit bigger here in this country. And, you know, of course, they had the two enormous hits, which weren't really indicative of stuff they had done before in a crazy little thing called Love, which is kind of like a little rockabilly thing. And then another one, Bites to Dust, which is all of a sudden this kind of funky, urban, kind of disco-y R&B soul piece, which, again, people loved here, right? Absolutely loved it. Uh, but, you know, there's other very solid to great Queen style songs on here, like the title track, Dragon Attack is enormous, you know, um, Sail Away Sweet Sister, you know, Save Me, some really, you know, typical Queen sounding things. Well, you know, this album did so well. In fact, this one did 4 million copies, never mind uh, the chart success of the two singles I mentioned, right? But I think the band were kind of like, wow, you know, another one Bites the Dust did so well, you know, maybe we should do like an, a whole album of stuff like that. And I'm sure the record label were like, yes, you know, dollar signs, dollar signs, right? So of course they put out Hot Space, which sank like the proverbial turd that it kind of is, right? And I'll go ahead and say it. I love this band. I know there's people out there who dig this album. I'm not one of them. Uh, a, it didn't, other than Under Pressure, which is totally not indicative of anything else on the album, which is the duet with Freddie and uh, David Bowie, which from what I've heard, it was just kind of thrown onto this album kind of at the last minute. This is all this kind of disco, urban, R&B, funky, type of stuff other than put out the fire which is your typical brian may got to have a heavy song on the album right but it's almost like uh that's brian's only appearance on the album for the most part so it's just to me it's unlistenable uh you know they tried to push body language as a single you know it's all of a sudden you got all these synths on the album remember this band was always promoting there are no synthesizers used on our albums and all of a sudden you're starting to see all this other stuff uh i don't know uh los palabras de amor I can kind of deal with that. It's got a nice vocal on it, but man, action this day, back chat, stay in power. It just doesn't work at all. And people just stayed away in droves. And quite frankly, this album pretty much killed it for Queen here in this country for pretty much the rest of their career. Unfortunately, you know, it's amazing how, when you look at a band riding so high with this, and then after this, you can't even get arrested here. They stopped touring here, right? I mean, this was a this was a killer for them in the states in North America, and they never recovered, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, so that's my uh, last pick here for the day. Perfect choice. Yeah, I mean, it it is one of those that always enters these discussions, right? And and me being a massive Queen fan, um, 
you know, it, you know, when you're a massive fan and you go, you go one album further than you're supposed to sort of thing. I, I don't, I'm definitely not a hot space fan, but I like about two fifths of the album and, and mostly the songs that you mentioned. Right. But, but all of that minimalist disco dance music, you know, from Berlin or whatever, right. That whole, that whole feel, uh, d- totally not into it. And, and you're right. I mean, it just dropped off. I mean, they had a little bit of a blip with radio Gaga and I want to break free. You know, there's a couple little singles later on, um, but they never recovered. And, and the game, you know, even, even the game we hated as kids because all we could get, you know, we can't get, couldn't get out of our head those, those two singles and how massive they were because of that stuff. But save me and sail away, sweet sister, and even play the game. What a great song. Yeah, right? it is. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a lot closer to a classic queen album than, uh, than obviously those, those singles would, would make you think. Um, so, so, so that, that really is the last great queen album. Uh, but, you know, the one thing I like about this one is that, um, it does have that pretty radical max slapping production uh, anytime there is any guitar or drums on it. Right. Which is rare. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, it's definitely always spoken of as one of these really hated follow-ups. So it's perfect, perfect choice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there you have it, everybody. Uh, some more letdowns after mega albums. Uh, if, if you think we've forgotten any, put them in the comments below. Martin and I will be checking that out. Uh, I think we've kind of uh, exhausted this topic, I think, for now. So uh, well, you we'll, were going to we'll... mention uh, you had a couple honorable mentions, didn't you? Yeah, I, I, I had one that definitely that I want to throw out there. And I'll, I'll preface this by um, saying I've actually never heard the album. So I'm just basically going off of, uh, you know, all the certifications and everything. So, and, and a bunch of you picked up on this on the last episode. So, you know, Meatloaf released this mega debut called Bad Out of Hell. Perhaps you might've heard that, uh, which sold like a gazillion copies and still sells like crazy. And it's one of those albums that everybody probably has owned at some point. Huge hit singles produced by, you know, they you got Todd Rundgren and he plays guitar on there and you got this great cast of characters, unforgettable songs. And then a couple of years later, uh, Meat puts out this album called Dead Ringer, which like does no business whatsoever. It, the album cover was very similar at a cool. It looked like Bad Out of Hell Part 2, but for whatever reason, nobody bought it. Uh, I don't even, did they even have a single from it? I don't even remember. I've never heard it. And considering how much, I, I mean, I must be like the rest of the universe because as much as I love Bad Out of Hell when it came out, I never even bothered or considered to buy Dead Ringer or even listen to it. And it wasn't until he decided, him and Jim Steinman decided many years later to do Bad Out of Hell Part Two as we're going moving into the 90s, all of a sudden people are like, yes, we're in love with Meatloaf again, right? And, and that salt did mega, mega business. So it's almost like is, is an artist tied to a concept and the only way they're ever going to make anything of themselves is to do that concept. I mean, this is a perfect example. The only Meatloaf albums that have ever sold and that people went and bothered to, to buy into were the Bad Out of Hell albums. And he's got plenty of others. Yeah. Nobody was interested unless it was Bad Out of Hell related. And, and the funny thing is, it's like just because you throw Bad Out of Hell in the title does not necessarily mean it's going to it's going to continue the greatness of that debut album. But people didn't care. They bought it anyway. Right. Because they wanted it to be. They yeah. wanted it to be the direct continuation of that first album. Yeah. It's funny, speaking of titles, it's like Dead Ringer is supposed to make you think it's a dead ringer for the first one, but it's also a, a negative sounding title, you know, death and it's dead and it's like yeah. dead in the water. This, this album's dead, right? So it, so it has that feel as well, right? Yeah. And, you know, so honorable mentions, I, you know, in terms of what I almost talked about, there was going to be Pink Floyd, The Wall to the Cut, uh, our final cut. There was... Um, you know, I, I know we talked about uh, the big drop in quality from Montrose one to paper money. Yep. Um, I was thinking of doing a black album to load. Um, you know, that's more load sold a lot, but it was a, it was a big critical drop, I think for them. Uh, what was the last? Oh yeah. Oh, Nirvana. The white, the Nirvana it, it, and the white snake one too. I'll, I'll talk about yeah, that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Nirvana from uh, you know, the big one to let's blow up our career with uh, within utero, which is, which is a very nasty, you know, violent sort of record compared to the previous, which had some, some sheen to it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, so I was talking about um, slip of the tongue by white snake, which followed up the, the self-titled 1987 blockbuster. And, uh, you know, again, uh, Coverdale changed the lineup. All of a sudden you got Steve Vai on board, who is, you know, quite the different guitar player from John Sykes. And, uh, you know, I, I like slip of the tongue, but it, it is not the artistic masterpiece that the 87 album is and probably 
slinks them a little further into that dreaded hair metal thing that I know they didn't like as a band that I don't like either. Um, but it, it's not as, you know, you look at Slide It In and the 87 album, and then you look at Slip of the Tongue. Yeah, there's some really good songs on there, but not quite what I wanted to hear from that band. And, you know, they went from selling, what, 7 million copies of the previous album. So I think that just went platinum, maybe two, something like that. So it was a pretty big disappointment and, uh, you know, would usher in a period of kind of inactivity for the band, you know, and Coverdale will go join up with Jimmy Page shortly thereafter and then do a little solo stuff. And then eventually, you know, bring White Snake back from the dead. So uh, yeah, that's yeah. my last choice. for. Today. One other one I almost looked at was uh, Bruce Springsteen born in the USA down to Tunnel of Love, right? And oh yeah yeah and whatever the yeah. other one's called human touch that whole yeah. period right so yeah yeah that's those albums are not very good <laughs> <laughs> not very good but you know what i think everybody back then uh laid the blame to the fact that uh, he wanted to do those albums on his own apart from the e street band and I, you know i've i've listened to bruce for on and off for a while and i always find that his most endearing albums are the ones where the full e street band is there with him Cool. So there you have it, everybody. So uh, once again, uh, if you think there's any we've missed here, remember, these are mega albums we're talking about, because I know a lot of people on the previous episode were picking albums that they just really like and didn't like the follow up. But we're talking like those really big albums, the ones that a lot of people bought, sold a lot of copies, a lot of hit singles, play the songs live all the time. Those are the ones we're really kind of looking at here. And then that follow up that just kind of was like dead in the water. Right. So uh Put them in the comments below uh, and we'll check them out and visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Martin and I'll be back next Friday with another cool concept that we're working on. We'll announce that during the week. And uh, so we'll see you then. Martin, anything last minute you want to uh, promote? Um, no, just martinpopoff.com for the books. I mean, I do have, this just came in last week, the new sweet book. It's not at my site yet, but uh, people can email me at martinp at inforamp.net and I can send a PayPal invoice. I've been shipping these out like a demon for the last little while. So that's the new suite. And the uh, I still have the angel, which came out a couple months ago. So yeah, martinpopoff.com. And before I forget, because I'm sure Steve uh, Keeler will appreciate this. So Martin and I will both be appearing on Steve Keeler's Rock Fantasy Files on that Wednesday, Martin. Wednesday, Wednesday night. Yeah. Wednesday night uh, a song, all a song, an episode all about the Who. Right. So we're going to be talking about our love for the Who, our favorite albums with Steve Keeler, and uh, I might have a couple other guests as well. So uh, check out that panel show over on Steve Keeler's The Rock Fantasy Files here on YouTube. So uh, we'll see you then for Martin Popoff. I am Pete Pardo. See you later, guys. Bye bye. <laughs>